The webinar is now live. Well, good evening, folks. Good evening, folks. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Um, tonight's presentation is brought to you by the New Jersey chapter of NOW, National Organization um, on Women, um, as part of their series that will lead, so, sorry, for women, as part of their series that will um, a, a lead to their annual conference. So um, first I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Danny Newberry. I am the coordinator for Union County's Office of LGBTQ Affairs. Um, Union County is the only county in the state of New Jersey that has established an office, um, a government office dedicated to supporting the LGBTQ community um, in our county, our elected officials, our freeholders, um, see supporting the LGBTQ community as an asset um, and um, not a liability. Um, so uh, I'm incredibly grateful um, for them uh, to, to, to bring this office to, to Union County and the work that I do. Um, and I, it is not our goal to have be the only office in uh, the state of New Jersey. Um, we are seeking, you know, we support more. Um, so uh, joining us this evening for our discussion on more than just pronouns. Um, and the discussion will, uh, we'll get into in a, in a gender binary world um, those who don't identify as male or female often have trouble fitting in. In a world that asks us to check a single box, male or female, what happens for those who don't feel either answer is exactly right? Our panel this evening will examine what it's like to navigate the intersections between gender, identity, and sexuality, especially as we wait for societal norms and structures to catch up. So um, I would like to introduce our panelists this evening. Unfortunately, um, our, our first panelist is unable to join us. Shannon, as um, a trip out of state, has left them on the side of the road this evening, but I have been reassured that they are safe, um, but they're unable to join us. Um, our second panelist, um, now our first, is Dr. Catherine Lug. Um, she is a professor of education, uh, Rutgers Graduate School of uh, Education, professor yeah, of education at Rutgers, um, and then Aaron uh, Worrell uh, from the Bayard Rustin Center um, for Social Justice. So I'm thrilled to be having this conversation with you this evening. And if you would just take a few moments to introduce yourselves um, and the work that you do. Okay, I'm Catherine Lug. I've been at Rutgers, uh, this is year 25. I'm a politics of ed scholar who looks at social movements and how the politics of these social movements can shape educational policy. And I've been focused on the LGBT civil rights mm -hmm. movements, collect, you know, it's not just one movement, since about 1996. So about 25 years. Wow, excellent. Um, Aaron? Hi, uh, yes. Uh, thanks for having me as well. Um, I'm Aaron Worrell. I'm a board member on the, at the Bayard Rustin Center for Social Justice, uh, which is located in Princeton. Uh, I, I personally, I live in Philadelphia, but I've been on the board there for about a year, and I grew up in East Windsor in Mercer County, so I uh, know the area well. Um, in fact, the, the founder of the center, uh, Robert Seda Schreiber, uh, we've been good friends for a long time. It's how I got connected with the center. And uh, our work, our mission has uh, started out about uh, in person, I guess you would say about two years ago, a lot of the work has revolved around educational advocacy for LGBTQ plus students, um, getting protections passed through the state legislature for LGBT students uh, to, you know, for example, for trans students to be able to use uh, facilities that are in alignment with their um, uh, gender presentation and, and so on and so forth. Also created a uh, an actual physical location for uh, LGBTQ plus youth to come and just have a you know safe and welcoming space to hang out, lots of programming, social events. And then since we've had to move online, uh, also been running uh, every weeknight what we're calling our social justice power hours, which have had all kinds of guests, authors, musicians, uh, social justice speakers, you name it. That's actually going on right now on our <laughs> own YouTube channel. So uh, Robert is over there handling that. I'm over here handling this and uh, 
feel free to go check that out. Uh, everything gets archived and thrown up on YouTube as well. So feel free to check that out. Excellent, excellent. Um, I have I have uh, tuned into a few of those and it's really, really, really great, really great work. Um, next, if we could, um, Dr. Uh, Catherine Lug has a presentation for us. We'll go into this presentation and then um, and then we'll 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 follow up with the discussion. I think it will bring us an opportunity to really engage in um, the important the topic. Okay, this is uh, on the topic for tonight. Uh, it's uh, gender in New Jersey, more than just pronouns. Um, and let's move to the next. And we're thinking about uh, sex, sexuality, and gender, and where things stand in the US, where are things in New Jersey, and are there some possible ways forward? Um, coming out of a historian's background, the, I look at history and the law. And so there are interesting definitions that we need to think about and also um, understandings of what are sexuality, sex, and gender. And for many of you, it's, this is gonna be old information. Next. Uh, sexuality is about whom you love. Uh, the old fashioned choice is a sexual object choice or the old fashioned term is sexual object choice, but that's very limiting and limited. We know uh, sexuality for many people, if not most is uh, pretty fluid and people can move along this continuum of um, sexual sexuality and who we fall in love with and who we uh, make commitments to and who we don't. Uh, historically, when we talk about sex, we mean chromosomal bi and slash biology. Um, and historically and uh, critically, the law has viewed sex uh, coming out of uh, Western Christ Christendom uh, dichotomously. So it's either XX or XY, though we know through science that there's at least seven variations. And people who have those chromosomal um, variations are known as intersex. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on intersexuality, but that is part of this um, spectrum. But our law tries to uh, dichotomize people. Gender, yeah, next slide. Gender has to do with one psychological understanding of sex and sexuality. And it's also mediated by uh, culture, race, locale, and historical era. One of my favorite um, activists historically was a, uh, trans man, uh, Polly Murray, who was born female, uh, was a civil rights activist slash lawyer uh, slash Episcopal priest towards the end of their life. And Murray, biggest intellectual influence was on Ruth Bader Ginsburg of blessed memory. Um, Murray was the one who said, you should look at sex like race when it comes to labor discrimination. And from her legal, or from their legal writings, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg took it and ran. But the intellectual forebear of all of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's work is Pauli Murray. Um, historically, individuals whose uh, gender identity is at variance to their biology is typically known as transgender or trans and people whose gender identity is congruent with biology is known as uh, cis, Latin for same side of. Um, what we've known through the science of all of this is that gender identity is established during the second trimester of gestation. And we know this through autopsy study of miscarriages, aborted fetuses, and also trans people who have later donated uh, their bodies to science, that the brain is actually uh, sexualized one way as the body is being sexualized a different way. And, um, and most trans people are aware of their identity by as early as age three. In fact, a colleague, um, her son who was born female at age three came out to the living room one Sunday afternoon and said, my name is Dragon and I am a boy. And from that moment on, Dragon lived his best life. Um, 
sexuality, sex, and gender profoundly one's identity, as well as how you're viewed by the law. And this is really important when we start talking about educational settings, because they're governed by law. Um, but they're also go governed by tradition. And they're actually, I'm working on a chapter, they're governed by uh, the physical plant of uh, how uh, bathroom space is laid out. Um, for much of U.S. history and um, especially U.S. legal history, sexuality was only, the only permissible sexuality was heterosexual. Sex was dichotomous, regardless of your biological reality. And gender was tightly um, really enforced to uh, enforce sexuality and um, sex expectations. So in the 1920s, as we, as a culture, we had better understandings of homosexuality, uh, trans identity, et cetera, et cetera. You started seeing all these laws against cross-dressing come into play. Uh, William Eskridge documents this in um, his book, Gay Law, 19, uh, 1999, Harvard University Press. And it's, it's pretty intense because what happens is, of course, we know law can be differentially enforced. And so generally trans women, especially trans women of color who may be poor are the most likely to uh, run into the police. Though it could, it varies from locale and situation. Um, these, narrow, these narrow social and legal constructions could adversely affect all Americans, but were especially toxic for trans and LGBT or LGB Americans. That said, things have slowly uh, getting better. I had a big surprise with the Supreme Court case in Bostock versus Clayton County in 2020, where the Supreme Court said, um, Russ, uh, written by Justice Gorsuch, who's a textualist, where he says, you read the law and then enforce it exactly as it's written. And he's po politically a conservative, but he read it as a textualist and he says, uh, Title VII of the uh, uh, Civil Rights Act says uh, you cannot discriminate in uh, labor by gender. Well, he read that literally and said, okay, so trans people are now and lesbian and gay and bisexual people are all covered by Title IX in employment. What it doesn't cover this case is uh, education and housing. And the current uh, minute, uh, national administration, the Trump administration is utterly hostile towards trans uh, people working in education and most awfully uh, trans children. The hostility is really pretty awful and, and I would argue lethal. Um, next slide, please. That said, New Jersey and some other states like California have a, have a fairly strong civil rights protections in employment, housing, and education. And in fact, New Jersey has its own equal rights amendment that was written into the constitution in 1947 when they had a constitutional convention right after World War II. And that's, you know, I know you don't have oodles of free time, but that's an interesting constitution because it's a post-Holocaust constitution. And so it's, it's why we are one of the more progressive states when it comes to civil rights. All that wonderful things said, um, enforcement and compliance, particularly with school districts has been haphazard. And especially again, for trans people of color. Uh, ways forward, I just wanna reiterate, our identities are complex. Um, and this can be troublesome in our lived experiences when we have a legal system that has historically dichotomized almost everything. Um, furthermore, the power structure favors the original US citizens, which are white guys with property. And a lot of us don't fit into that shoebox. Um, what I would suggest in uh, in keeping with now's tradition of activism, we should continue to um, advocate for legislation that liberates 
our sisters and comrades from oppression and work in coalition with our like-minded uh, organizations and individuals. We can never have too many allies going forward. And I'll be happy to take questions now or later, but thank you. Thank you uh, so much for that presentation. Um, I, was, I was taking a few notes because I think that um, it really and truly what I walked, uh, coming into the conversation and then uh, having that, having, um, you know, Seth, you know, heard your presentation. What I get from that is that words matter, um, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and 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 it's not about being like it's not about being politically correct, as you know, some people have made that sound, that term sound derogatory. It's about being respectful, and it's about empowering people to own their own identity. Mm -hmm. So, um, can we? Mm -hmm. uh, I I really, you know. <laughs> Our conversation, and, I, and I'm realizing this as as we started, you know, talking. Uh, we started we started our conversation, and it's really at my fault that we started without even introducing our pro ourselves with our pronouns, which I know, I, and I'm so sorry, because I, I would have I would have been the one to take the lead on that and have have having done that. Um, and and I know that like, from from my experience, if we can get um, if we can get the community around us, if we can make it a regular, if we can normalize the idea of using pronouns, um, mm -hmm. when we introduce ourselves, um, we're not calling anybody out in that process of using pronouns, right? So this conversation, so I, I apologize for having not done that. Um, but to go deeper into the, to the value of words, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, so, so if you want to touch on maybe uh, where we're at in a, as, as a society, right? With the use of words and, um, and how, like what a strategy might be for us as a community. Cause to, to, to really embrace it and to encourage people to, to uh, address language, um, m honestly more respectfully mm -hmm. and inclusive. One approach and it's kind of an old, um, again, I'm a historian. Uh, what uh, Harvey Firestone would say is that you assume everyone is trans until proved otherwise. Mm -hmm. You start that with your basic assumption. And, you know, if we're all sitting in various kinds of leadership positions, that opens the door for greater conversations. So yes, I'm, I'm uh, of a different generation. So I identify as queer, but then she, hers, et cetera. And I think part of that is just generational, to be quite mm. honest. Uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting. So I, I don't think I'm in the same generation as you are. I'm not obviously not gonna ask anybody to prove that, but... Uh, <laughs> But I'm definitely also older than the the coming up generation. I'm not a I'm not Gen Z. I'm not depending on who you ask. I'm a millennial or not. I could be a late Gen X. You know, I'm in that group. So, yeah. And and I was I sort of grew up in the same thing. A lot of this is is also new to me, which is why I didn't notice that we forgot to in, in a panel that is called more than just pronouns. We didn't even start with pronouns, which it, it's still something that I, I think a lot of us. Are getting used to and and I do I, I do get the importance of it I also so I do identify as trans but I also use she and her pronouns um, I, I do f locate myself you know more along the bi gender binary I suppose as it you know socially as it exists um, so uh, I don't know if I have a particular point there other than to say that I think it is just a it's a I don't know that it's strictly generational. I think it is just more of a personal thing. Although I do agree that I think younger people are kind of coming into, they're coming into society, coming into society as adults already having this framework. And I think that makes a big difference that it's just assumed that maybe not everyone's gonna be he or she and you can't necessarily tell by looking at them and so on. So. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that the the concept of um, you know engaging in conversations with um, people you're you're not familiar with, engaging them in a conversation with the assumption that maybe that that everybody is transgender really brings out the idea that you allow them to to 
to announce to you their pronouns. You allow them to introduce their gender identity to you rather than, rather than that making that process of, of individuals making a biased assumption. Um, I think that's really, that's, it, it, it's really powerful. Um, we do have a, a, a question. Um, I will uh, read, we have a question from one of our viewers. It's a, uh, the question is how do we introduce um, this conversation at the employers, at, at, to all employers, to ensure management and staff are aware and practicing uh, pro using appropriate pronouns. Okay. I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Catherine. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I would, be, uh, if it is a private employer or public employer, um, and to be very bureaucratic, you go through the HR department and you point to New Jersey laws and codes that cover all of this and golly gee, they don't wanna run afoul of that. And we want to be a progressive, wonderful place to work. And so we have to offer in most places, ongoing continuing professional development. And we should probably dedicate a few sessions every year until we get people up to speed. Sure. Um... Yeah, that, that was pretty much going to be my, if, if it's a large enough employer to have an HR department, that's definitely a place to start. If it's a large enough employer to have a, what my company would call an affinity group, you know, the, a pride group within the organization, mm -hmm. uh, as a lot of businesses do these days, um, they would definitely be um, a, a, an avenue for getting that sort of messaging, getting that sort of presentation, maybe finding an appropriate speaker on the topic to presented either to a management level or to um, you know, the, the broader uh, employee base, you know, to everybody in the company is, uh, is what we do. If it's a small company, you know, if it's you know, a mom and pop business, then you know, it's just gonna be personal conversations. And that's really the, mm -hmm. uh, the size of the organization is gonna dictate the strategy, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I think the idea, um, I do really like the idea of a resource group or an affinity group where um, you uh, have a, an a smaller employee group of people um, who either identify as part of, our, of the LGBTQ community or are, are, are allies and want to, um, want to increase allyship, you know, uh, amongst employees. I think it's, um, I think that that is a really great um, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's a really great resource that um, employers, depending on their size, could use um, to, to, to bring awareness. Um, um, another, another question we have, uh, I'm not sure how this, how, okay, short of wearing signs, how does the average person know what pronouns to use when first meeting someone? And I think we've, I, I, I really like, you can go ahead and answer, but I, I had, go ahead. Well, I do, I do know a lot of people, especially friends of mine who are non-binary uh, and use some, a pronoun like they and them, they actually do wear a sign. They'll, they'll put a button or a badge on their jacket because it, it just helps, you know, it just kind of signals that. Um, there are other, you know, groups that I'm in my, my church that's actually, we have name tags to make coffee hour easier and everyone just has their pronoun on their name tag. It makes life easier. So uh, actually wearing signs is, oh, sorry, my cat wants to be part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually wearing signs is not necessarily a bad idea. Um, and I think, you know, Danny, I don't know if this is what you were gonna head back to, but it's, it's the idea of normalizing that conversation, making it part of introductions. Um, yeah. You know, when you first meet somebody, it's just, you know, Oh hey, I'm Erin, and I, you know, my pronouns are she and her. It just it, it feels weird to me. It feels weird at first, but the more it becomes normalized, right. the less weird it feels. I think so. And given the fluidity of identity on sex, sexuality, and gender, give people the right, or that people have the right to define themselves. Right. Yeah, and I think that can, let's can we talk a little bit about. Um, the idea of of if you if you innocently misgender someone, um, what can an ally do? How should an ally respond that would be respectful? I mean, I have an idea of what that would be, but I'd like to hear from you, like, because uh, I, I know that it happens. Even I have. I mean, we in our own community have have made these slip ups, um, 
and uh, so the idea of language and how important it is but then when you when when you do make a mistake and you misgender someone um how should someone how should we respond um you know when i misgender and i'm trying to do it less and less i just apologize correct yep yeah <laughs> i i think that some people feel like moving, I, I, I like the idea of just moving on is not it's that doesn't show respect, right? So, lady, I that's what I was getting at is is apologizing, um, and 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 having that dialogue between if someone were to misgender me and I, I would say I'm sorry, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, um, and, and then and then just being able to reiterate to someone, you know, that having that 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 respectful dialogue. Um, I think that someone who makes a mistake should feel empowered or encouraged to apologize. Absolutely, yeah. It's, I, I get called sir on the phone all the time by customer service people. And I usually just say, sorry, it's ma'am or miss. And, oh, sorry, conversation continues. That's, to me, that's the best way to, I, that's what I want somebody to do. I won't say that my answer is everybody's answer, but that's what I want somebody to do. Acknowledge the mistake, apologize, move on, <laughs> so. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I was misgendered today at Shoprite. Yeah, my hair is very short, um, but I let it slide just because I was tired. <laughs> sure, sure, um, very good. Um, so let's talk. Uh, I, I'd like to get beyond the pronouns, um, as <laughs> as you know, our panelists entitled, um, and let's talk about language in general, and. Um, like for one, for example, um, like one of the now and now and Jay's initiatives is uh, influencing the language between, for example, menstrual products versus feminine products, right? So let's talk about the importance of language um, and and its role in being inclusive and um, in that way. Yeah, I mean. Feminine products is a dodge. Yeah. <laughs> it's a marketing dodge. It's, a it's just a euphemism. <laughs> we don't want to talk about what it's really for. So well, let's call it something else. <laughs> yeah. And it gets to, you know, to the old bias that menstruation is icky. Well, no, it's just part of life. Yeah. You know, and if we just kind of demystify a lot of this stuff. Sure. And nor yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree, Catherine. A lot of it is just it's the it's it's funny. It's that the, the gendered term is a way to avoid talking about biology <laughs> in, okay. in, in in a lot of cases. I, I don't I can't think of anything that's quite as specific as menstrual products, but same idea. It's like oh, well, biology is too messy. Let's just you know call it you know women's issues or men's health or or whatever you know all those things. When if you just said you know menstrual products or, you know, I, I, I'm trying to, it's hard to think of something that's so euphemized on the men's side, which is what's complicated about it. But uh, um, I don't know, prostate health, let's, let's go with that one or something like that, you know, so. But yeah, but you see ads for now, even on TV for prostate health. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Got me there. <laughs> the ads, you know, and I think it goes back to just this uh, misogyny. Mm in the in the culture that you know since women are icky menstruation is icky feminine mm. products mm. that's it that's a really good yeah that's it that's a really good point um i i want to i want to go further into to the uh language but we do have another question so let's um let's keep rolling with those and it's the question is how are the pro how are the pronouns used to address someone in a conversation when speaking to the person so we're going back to pronouns real quick. Not sure if I understand the con the question fully. Okay. How are pronouns used to address someone in conversation when speaking to the person? So if you are speaking to someone, like we're having a conversation, oh. right? Um, how 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 can we? Um, uh, how are pronouns used? Um, I mean, it might be, they might be used in an introduction. We're, we're having a conversation, another person comes in and I might be, you know, and I might introduce you to another person. Um, I, I mean, 
respectfully, I would use your name, <laughs> um, right? And then, and then we would allow the conversation to happen. And um, if, you know, pronouns became part of the, you know, conversation, then I think, I, I don't know, like, have you been in scenarios where you've been introduced to a group of people or, um, I mean, where we've, in general, where we use pronouns? I, I mean, I think that's the only inter interaction where I would use a pronoun. Well, it's, it's gendered pronouns that are the problem. They generally isn't a problem. Correct. You isn't a problem. I, me, that's okay. But it's when you slide into the gendered pronouns where we kind of run into buzzsaws. And I think for, particularly if people are struggling with just reconceptualizing maybe 40, 50 years of, you know, programming by our culture, um, defaulting to the specific isn't a bad idea. You know, default mm -hmm. to you or we or mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. When I, I like when I'm re referring to a group of people, I, I tend to use folks or people so that we're not genderizing a group, a, a group as, as a specific and, and we, we, we allow there to be a fluidity within that group of people and let them own their own. Um, so I tend to use folks, you know, um, that kind of thing. There was a question, I'm not sure where it went. I mean, as somebody who grew up in New Jersey, it's gonna take me the rest of my life to stop saying you guys and- uh, Right. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I and I, I've got to say, we've got a rich linguistic tradition in the United States of the word y'all, and I think it's perfect substitute. So there's your second person right. pronoun that doesn't gender anybody. That's so. correct. Mm -hmm. but yeah, that's that's pretty. Uh, that's really good. Um, and you all make my in-laws very happy because they're in South Carolina. So thank you. <laughs> y'all. Um, <laughs> I, I like y'all. Um, so can we talk a little bit because the language matters and how uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the influence that schools have on at the, such a young age have on defining or impressing upon an individual what their gender may be um, before they, they, they real, they, they're, they're realizing that they can own their, their can, they can own their gender identity. Um, you know, I, I have some examples uh you know um of how dangerous it can be i think but if you want to just get into the idea of how important it is and what the school if you're familiar with the state laws new jersey state laws on what schools should be doing to accommodate um uh to to, to respectfully provide um uh, you know uh, um support the our, our non our gender our transgender and non-binary students mm -hmm. um if you're familiar with those laws, that'd be really great if you could um, talk about that a little bit, but then also let's get into the conversation about uh, the role that, role that's, that education plays. Um, yes, yeah, state law and code are very supportive of trans students. And so uh, school administrators, principals, building principals, as well as superintendents legally are obligated to recognize the gender that the child claims. Now, does this happen in every public school in the state of New Jersey? No, but they are under legal obligation to follow the law. Now, what can happen is, again, uh, some administrators are very old school and this can be profoundly threatening to their worldview. But that's about them. It's not about mm -hmm. serving children. And so I encourage, you know, because I my job is to prepare principals. Okay. From public schools. And my job is what is in the best interest of the children. And what is in the best, you know, and we've got reams of research that you recognize the identity they claim. You support that identity. You do not out them to their parents if they're not out to their parents. Now, some states this summer started passing laws saying that you must out children to their parents. Mm -hmm. And this is really dangerous stuff. But I just want to clarify that in the state of New Jersey, that is not the case. That is not the case in New Jersey. New Jersey, um, Illinois, 
California are very progressive on this matter. Um, elementary schools historically have been the most aggressively at imposing gender, you know, from the bathroom, mm -hmm. in class games, or the girls are on this side. Yeah. Yes. You just have to be a lot more creative. And that's a good thing in education. We want creative people. <laughs> and um, I, I don't have a lot of contact with the education world, I will admit. Um, but just from talking to friends of mine who are teachers who do work in the elementary setting, a lot of it is just, you know, th there are more and more resources that are coming out that help teachers. Uh, I don't know if I, I'm sorry that I don't have any to name off the top of my head, but you know, there, there are more, oh, here we go. <laughs> Oops, it's disappearing into the camera, but there you go. Transgender students in elementary school. There you go, Dr. Lug has one for you. Right <laughs> my colleague, by my colleague, Melinda Magden. There you go. It's just out. Just oh, but also um, just more, uh, both resources like that, just professional resources, but also from what I understand, there's more, I guess maybe you'd call them learning tools that are becoming available. Books that are geared towards children that can, uh, you know, materials that can be used in the classroom. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I understand correctly, uh, there was an update made to the state curriculum to include more uh, LGBTQ content at, at age appropriate levels in, in the schools. So, but, but it has to be from kindergarten through 12th grade. So, so, and generally the first places they start are the English and social studies curricula. You have it so you know reading you can you know it's kids have to learn to read so they're learning all sorts of things so mm -hmm. but dr magnan's book is about exemplary uh principles serving trans children in elementary schools and it's just out this month oh, wonderful oh, that's fantastic um how can parents, if I, I know this is, is still a little bit into the, to the elementary, and I just want to make sure, um, you know, we, we, our conversation is vast as we can get it in an hour, but how can parents of uh, elementary students or, or, you know, of their elementary uh, child, or even in the middle school or high school, how can parents support their, their youth? Um, um, and not just, uh, in the variety in allowing them to 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 be whom they are um and advocate for the, an advocate at school for inclusion um you know when a when an individual may you know like you said separate a classroom by boys and girls and girls get this toy and boys get this toy and then that you've you've defined for a child who they are um how can we as parents advocate for our youth um in the school system in New Jersey, all mm -hmm. administrators and all teachers have to uh, have ongoing professional development. And so see if, you, if you're not willing to do it yourself, and a lot of people would rather have their teeth grilled mm -hmm. um, than go in and actually work with, uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard work. Um, there are a lot of vendors out there who will provide the professional development to uh, school districts. The uh, New Jersey School Board Association will do this, the Principals Association, and JEA does this. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of private vendors as well, as well as my colleague Melinda Magan, who just wrote this book. And so, if I can put in a shameless plug, come talk to us at the Rustin Center. This is the type of work we do. We help one of our, one of the reasons we were created is to facilitate these kinds of conversations, you know, to, to be the people who can you know, pick up the phone and call, uh, you know, Carol Wachtler is one of our people who does a lot of that work and has done a lot of that work, or Robert has done it. He was a former middle school teacher. Mm -hmm. um, what inspired him to get involved in this kind of work for students. It's, uh, you know, my parents, when I was younger and I was in the process of coming out and a lot of these resources didn't exist, there were still groups like PFLAG out there that have a lot of resources for parents. Uh, and, um, yeah, my, my mom told me to continue to plug them because she still finds them to be a really useful mm -hmm. source of information, even though her kid is well out of school. <laughs> so, yeah. oh, that's great. Um, it's really important. I know in the Princeton area, there used to be high tops. I don't know. There, if, yep. yep. Right next door to our center. Yep. <laughs> um, 
So, so uh, back in your, for people who aren't familiar, that's actually a, a peer education group. So that's actually students working with students, which is an interesting um, a model as well. But that can also help when we were talking earlier about how to get these sorts of things into classes and into schools. You know, they will actually have, uh, mostly I think at the high school level, but they'll have teenagers talking to teenagers about how to navigate these issues for themselves. Mm. And that's a helpful thing. Yeah, so. uh, GAZAP, which is the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology at Rutgers, runs the uh, Sex Etc. Center. And they offer uh, peer training on sexuality and gender and uh, gender identity. Mm -hmm. and have for the last 20, almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. and they, have a, they have an online magazine called Sex, Etc. And also they have peer mentors like the center. Uh, excellent. Those are excellent resources. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people um, appreciating the, the shout outs to these organizations and these resources as we're going through. So this is really, really, really good. Um, so can we talk a little bit about what, uh, what happens to those who don't feel like they're female, that, that they identify as male or female um, on the spectrum and um, how our language, I, I keep going back to language because we're trying to get, um, uh, you know, beyond the pronouns. So I, I just want to keep going back to language because um, I want to identify what can we do um, what legislation can we be passing to advance some of the stuff? I know that it comes down to, as you mentioned in your presentation, it comes down to what you say, differential uh, enforcement, um, I think is what you said uh, in your presentation. And I think that that's, that, that is a really important point. Um, and that, that comes back to the advocacy part of it on behalf of parents. But can we talk a little bit about um, what we can do, because there is an impact when we define, define people as male or female, and those are the only options. There is a significant impact. And can we talk a little bit about what more can we be doing um, as a society in, in places of, you know, in our hospital, uh, you know, in places of employment, in, in our hospitals, um, you know, places where we serve the community? Is there a way that we can be more inclusive um, in our serve, in, in our even our intake of ser for for services. I go ahead. I'd say for sure. Um, I think I, it, and it is changing. I do know that, for example, um, my doctor and uh, to drag my mom into the conversation again. She said she actually has seen it at her doctor's office, which is just a regular, you know, family practice in in Mercer County. There that uh, they're starting to ask questions more inclusively in the intake forms. So they'll ask you know, what is your gender? What is your assigned sex at birth? Because that is a medical, medically important piece of information. Uh, but, you know, what is your, you know, what is your preferred name, preferred pronoun? Because again, if you haven't navigated all the legal issues yet, um, you know, with insurance or ID documents or whatever, which is a whole other, you know, situation that we haven't even gotten into yet, um, there may not be a match there. You know, you may have, if you're, you know, if you're transitioning and you're not out to your employer or insurance companies still require you to be male or female, there's no, as far as I know, there aren't any major insurance companies out there that are offering an X option or an other option, um, you know, or an intersex option, you know, for people who actually are born with physically different anatomy. Uh, they still have to kind of get slotted into one of two boxes and, um, you know, so, so those are things, like I said, intake forms, any kind of social services. I know medical, it gets really complicated because there's coding and billing issues, um, you know, legal intake services, anything like that. I think there's a big opportunity there to just, if, first of all, question whether you need to have that information mm. and you do for some sort of medical legal compliance reason, is there a way to expand your intake so that while you're capturing legally and medically accurate information, you are still offering people who your clients to come in and have the opportunity to say, but please address me this way, please. This is how I define myself. Yeah, thinking about insurance, and this is just because I used to work in a business college many years ago. Insurance, every insurance company is regulated by each state. Yeah. So it's incumbent on the state regulatory scheme because they have to be licensed to offer insurance products in the state of New Jersey 
to actually comply with New Jersey law around gender and identity. Mm -hmm. And so the state, if they wanted to, could actually start twisting arms on, on this point. And I would encourage us mm -hmm. to communicate to the commissioner of insurances. Hmm. Who, I didn't know that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they should be compliant mm -hmm. with New Jersey law. Um, I do know the forms have changed quite a bit. Um, I also like to, you know, because I'm a prof, I get hit with a lot of surveys. And so I feel it's incumbent on me to point out the flaws in survey design. So, you know, if you're going to ask me to fill out a survey. So, you know, so tell me about some of the flaws in the survey, survey designs, because I think that that I think that's helpful information just to wrap our heads around. Well, generally, you don't want to code on a lot of things. If you're if you're running a large data set, the fewer codes you have, the, the easier it is to crunch the numbers. Mm -hmm. And so it's not nothing intrinsically discriminatory, but it is discriminatory by design because they just want to go one or zero mm -hmm. and I take see. the coding from there. But if you say no, gender. It's much more fluid than that. You have to have a lot of codes. Well, actually get, they'll actually get much better data. The, yeah, that's what I was gonna get at, to the point of, they would have stronger data, they would have, right. Yeah. The I mean, biggest errors I see from people who have not had a, you know, a, a prof, let's just say an, an aware reader, uh, the two biggest mistakes I see around trying to be more inclusive in gender and surveys, and these are just, you know, free advice from somebody who's ran into this brick wall a few times. Um, the options are not male, female, and trans. <laughs> You've got to be bigger than that. Um, and please also don't put, um, please define, you know, if, you, if you need the data about, uh, shall we say romantic orientation it, or you know, sexual, the, the sexual orientations are not lesbian, gay, bi, and trans. Trans yeah. is, is an intersexual orientation. So that's the wrong place for it. And don't treat it as a single option for gender because I think most trans people are going to look at that and say, but you know, it, maybe like me, like I, if I'm, if I'm only given two options, I'll choose female. If I'm given four options, mm. you know, male, female, trans woman, trans man, then I'll be more specific. Yeah. Um, you know, and the more options, the better, like, like Dr. Lug said, the more options you get, the better uh, data you'll get. You'll get more detailed I, I don't know. I don't know surveys and statistics, but I'm sure you'll get more detailed mm -hmm. information. I, I know there's a word cross tabs that you'll get a lot more cross tabs. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the other thing is NCES, which is the National Center of Educational Statistics. They do a lot of data gathering, and um, activists have been pushing on NCES to go down a much more expansive understanding of sexuality and gender, particularly. Mm -hmm collecting data on um, it's, it's the elementary and secondary schooling data. Um, and the Obama administration toward the end had agreed. And of course this all died with the Trump administration, but I am cautiously optimistic if things go well in November that we might have actually better educational data coming our way mm -hmm. because it'll be more, it'll be more accurate. It'll be more reflective of the, uh, populations that we have. I mean, sadly, the most accurate data on youth are the um, mental illness surveys, yeah. which are actually the most expansive, but it plays to a horrendous area. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So you're collecting data mm -hmm. to try to designate, you know, to, to try to imply that your gender identity or sexual orientation um, is a is a mental health issue, and it's absolutely not. So I can see where that is detrimental. Yeah. Um, absolutely, and I, you know, to to get back, like um, in the foster care system, like you know, uh, as an office of LGBTQ affairs, we've partnered with the Department of, of uh, Children and Services to to host um, events where we try to partner um uh resource homes resource parents with uh, coming you know with youth and one of the issues that i've discovered through the d division is that they don't have a system for identifying which youth 
identify uh, as part of the LGBTQ community um, or, or, you know, um, so the, there's not a system unless it's, unless it's a behavioral or, or um, uh, you know, or, or mental health uh, questionnaire. Um, there's not a system to, to allow, to empower them to identify. And I think that I, I agree. I think that's, I think it's detrimental. Um, and there has got to be a better way to do this, you know? Um, yeah, it just takes creativity. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't know if you had any other questions. There, there was something I, I kind of wanted to bring into yeah. the conversation and it actually bounces off something. You mentioned, uh, Dr. Lug, that you had a book coming out that was gonna talk about physical plant and uh, which if you don't know architecture or engineering, uh, in this case, in, in the, the thing that that's important about is, is that that means bathrooms or possibly locker rooms. I don't know mm -hmm. how expensive your book is, but um, you know, anytime you talk about trans people, that's always the, 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 the sticking point. You know, so but what about bathrooms? What about change rooms? What about uh, you know, locker rooms? And you know, one thing that I wanted to point out, if, if we're talking about things that people can advocate for, uh, is actually something that, that is the law in my current home city in Philly. And, from uh, actually just learned about last week from um, I'm going I'm going to uh, plug a, an information source here but if you aren't if you listen to podcasts and you aren't listening to 99% Invisible do it it's a great podcast about architecture and design and they actually had an episode last week about the laws surrounding bathrooms mm -hmm. and why those can actually be an obstacle because the model architectural code apparently which is a, a law that architects came up with and said, here's the best ways to write laws about how buildings should be built and how they should be made safe. Say right now, we should have every, uh, the, the, the law on bathroom is you must have male and female restrooms in every building, public building. That's actually what the law, the model law says because the model law is like 50 years old. Yeah. They're actually updating it right now to say that that is no longer going to be a requirement. And so if all you have is single, person restrooms that's fine that and they do not have to be marked one way or the other and that's actually already the law in philadelphia that was passed some about four years ago i want to say if you have a single occupancy restroom in a building in a restaurant mm -hmm. uh, you know office building whatever it cannot be labeled male or female it just has to be bathroom okay. and yeah. anybody can use it and it doesn't matter um, and in fact, there's even an, a tip line to the mayor's office of LGBT affairs, where if you were in a building that hadn't caught up yet, you could just send them a Facebook message, send them a text and say, hey, could you come talk to this restaurant for it? You, you, you didn't have to be the person to go talk to that restaurant. You could just mm. tell the mayor's office. They tend to, tend to send it over to the licensing department and have someone come out and say, hey, you gotta fix that. It's the city law. So pushing on your municipalities Mm. You adopt things like that is a, a small and easily accessible and local issue because those aren't those might be statewide laws, but they're also usually they're often county or city laws. Interesting. So you work in your own town and say, hey, what does the city code say mm -hmm. about bathrooms? Do they allow for gender inclusive restrooms? You know, do they allow single occupancy restrooms to be labeled without gender? And, and, and also one of those things that, you know, the reason it's such an issue is that obviously we were talking earlier about societal taboos and uh, around all kinds of body, body functions, but also it's a health issue for trans people. If we don't feel how we have a safe place to pee, mm -hmm. that's bad for your health. If you're holding it in all day, that's really bad for your kidneys and you don't want to do that. And a lot of people end up hurting themselves that way. Either they don't drink water or they hold it all day. And, you know, that it's, that's sort of a, it's that's a, a very un you know unglamorous but very important day to day thing that people can work on to to improve the lives of gender variant people of all kinds. But if if all bathrooms are labeled gender neutral, it doesn't matter if you have short hair and get called sir and shop right or you know right. or if you look exactly like the person who's expected to be in that room. It does it just doesn't it makes it not an issue anymore. So. Well well, the other thing is um, privacy. You know, and this gets to the issue of locker rooms. A lot of locker rooms are open. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's offensive to a lot of religious students. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And so you could actually end up with unlikely allies on this. Right. By making, by saying, look, we can have inclusive locker rooms that are also provide a measure of privacy for all students. Mm. You know, and it's, you know, that's kind of an idealistic way of going at it. But locker rooms are problematic for a whole bunch of people. And it has to do with, you know, certain religious conventions or personal needs. And yeah, I mean. I hated getting changed in the locker room in high school. And it didn't matter that I was in the one that was coded correctly for my biology at the time. I just, at my presentation at the time, I just didn't want to take my shorts off in front of a bunch of other kids. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, who most, wants to do that when they're a teenager, you know? <laughs> so, nobody. Yeah. So, nobody. So, then I join the marching band and everyone just changes in the band room because you don't have time, but that's a different story. <laughs> but, but marching band isn't the same as having to get undressed and no, go. It's, like, no, it was, that was just a joke. I was just playing yeah. there. So, no, and I, I think that it's it's um, it, correct me if I'm wrong. In the state of New Jersey, um, are, we are the progressive, you know, progressive in that you, an individual, by law, is permitted to use the bathroom for which they identify. Yes. Right. Yes. So no matter, and and this is sometimes because I've had this conflict, and I'm not going to say where, um, but I've gotten this question, and I thought it was a little absurd, but. Um, no matter the gender expression of the individual, mm -hmm. right? So a gender, uh, a person's gender expression may be very, very fluid, mm -hmm. but their gender identity, um, they, it, it may not be as fluid um, and they, it, right? So, so they're using the bathroom for which they identify, but on that day, their gender expression um, may not match what one would assume, you know, what we make a lot of assumptions. So um, I've had the the phone call where like that person doesn't belong in the bathroom, and I know I know it's like it's it I get I get very very flustered. It, but but the advocacy end of that, the conversation that is had there, um, it takes it takes a it takes it takes time. Yeah. But it, it also takes an understanding of gender identity, gender expression. And you know, sexual orientation has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not you can use that bathroom. And I think people confuse all three of those aspects. Well, because historically, gender was taken as a proxy for sexual orientation. Mm. So how you did your gender was taken as a proxy for whether you were homosexual, <laughs> bisexual. And um, Jackie Blount, who's a historian at uh, Ohio State has a great article in 1996 Harvard Ed Review called Manly Men and Womanly Women. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's this um, using how you present on gender as a proxy. And particularly public schools were notorious. You, I can remember student teaching many years ago and I had to be in hose in heels every day mm -hmm. now in a skirt now teaching beginning tuba in a skirt is a hell of a trick. <laughs> <laughs> so all the skirts were below my knee, you know, yeah, it was, it was a different time and place. <laughs> That's, um, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we have a question that just came in from Facebook, from a Facebook viewer. What happens if a minor and the legal guardian slash parent do not agree on the minor's preferred pronouns and identity. And after we're done with that, I want to address the word preferred. Um, so uh, the question again is what if a minor, uh, a minor and a legal guardian or parent do not agree on the minor's preferred pronouns and identity? This happens. Um, and the law is such that the child's identity is what holds, hmm. not the parent's wishes. Um, yes, right. And they're in the school, so it, the educational setting or the professional um, has no obligation. There's no obligation to tell a parent that. Um, That's that right. Has, that, right. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, to, to be sure. Um, they have an obligation I, to protect the child. 
That's correct. That's the legal obligation. They can lose their license if they fail to protect children. Very good, very good. And, um, and I wanna go back to the word preferred um, because for me, it sounds like it's an option. Mm -hmm. And for those whom I know that have, you know, pronouns other than what they were assigned at birth, it is not a preference. Mm -hmm. It is who they are. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I want to normalize the lack of use of the word preferred in front of pronouns, right? Um, mm -hmm. What are your pronouns? Um, or these are my pronouns. These are not my preferred pronouns. These, this is not an option to call me uh, something else. This is who I am. So um, if, if you've been impacted by that, or if, if, you, um, if you disagree or you agree, I, I'd like to hear from you on the word um, in that situation of preferred. Well, this is uh, an updated uh, rhetorical trick that we also heard around sexual preference. Mm -hmm. and oh, okay. I was thinking of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that all of this stuff is just a mere fashion choice. Mm -hmm. As opposed to identity realization and manifestation. Yeah. Mm. And so, what you have to do, what I have to do, is do a better job of teaching mm. and just kind of gently explaining. And a lot of this, for some folks who are deeply religious and their religion says everything is dichotomous, this mm. is profoundly threatening. Um, but I would gently point out that religion had a hard time with the discovery of the ovum in 1803, when all of a sudden <laughs> it realized that it took two to produce a baby. <laughs> and prior to that, reproduction was just an all guy thing and women were what were known as the uh, Aristotelian flower pots. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a heck of a phrase. <laughs> I wish it were mine, but it's not. <laughs> um. um, and 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 I don't. I know we're we're getting close on eight o'clock. Yeah, I don't know how much more time we have, but um, you know, as as somebody whose whose background is in law, the other thing I, I just because I, I also mentioned something about identity documents earlier is right. I did do a little looking up what the New Jersey law is around that, and I in keeping with the fact that it's one of the more progressive constitutions and states around these issues, I did find some pretty encouraging information that there is an option for a, a, a third, I, they, they call it a third gender license, but your state ID card can have an X instead of M or F on it, I mm -hmm. believe I saw. And I think they're making an update that make it easier to get that changed where the, the, the current sort of state of play is that you have to have some sort of medical professional write a letter just saying this person should have their card change and I believe that's I didn't get all the details I didn't have time to do all the research but that is under discussion and that is going to be made easier so mm -hmm. that people can self-define more easily and just go to the DMV or the MVC or whatever it's called in New Jersey I don't remember <laughs> yes I don't remember anymore um and, and just get that changed. So it'll be easier to do, which, um, which actually in a lot of ways follows um, what was the process that was going on at the federal level too for passports, that passports are actually relatively easy to change as well. Mm. Uh, that actually hasn't changed in the last four years uh, that I know of, that you can actually just with a doctor's note get a passport change um, and you have to reapply for your passport. It's a little bit of a process, but those are things that are doable um, a lot more easily than they were when I was trying to do all that stuff mm. 15 years ago. <laughs> so, mm. uh, and it's getting better and getting easier all the time, especially in places like New Jersey where they're, they're trying to make it much more of a self-defined process rather than, and, and take out some of these medicalized aspects of it. So. Yeah, and it should be self-defined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, we, we won't go there because we'll be here another hour, but the idea of, of um, the th a third option as a gender on your driver's license also gets into um, the social justice and, and policing and those engagements where it, it actually could be, it, hopefully we're going to see that it will benefit 
um, you know, we'll be able to use that information to de-escalate situations where um, a person may be misgendered in an interaction or an engagement. So um, I, I hope that our, I see, and, and this is the unintended, well, they may be intended actually, but these are the impacts that being, being aware and inclusive and changing our laws, changing archaic laws, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and really uh, uh, being inclusive and understanding uh, the, the range, the fluidity of, of, of gender identity expression and, and all of that, um, that we can actually uh, support society in a way, you know, um, that that is safer, that is, you know, we're, we're happier people, we're healthier people, all of those things. Um, <laughs> To, to, to very briefly sort of allude to something that, that Dr. Love talked about earlier is that a lot of this stuff comes from laws that were developed in an era when there were, you know, they call it separate spheres that men had a place and women had a place and never the two should come together. Mm -hmm. And that there's were strictly defined roles and you knew somebody by looking at them, which one they were. I, as far as I know, that's the only reason why gender is even on your driver's license. It's, mm -hmm. it's theoretically an anti-fraud measure. Oh, well, if this person's a man and it says F on their driver's license, clearly that's not their doc. The, and the only reason I know that is because that's actually how Philadelphia bus passes were until about 10 years ago, um, where you had a sticker on your bus pass that just said, it didn't have your name, it didn't have anything else, but it was a sticker that said M or F on it to keep, and, and, and this is actually, I believe the justification I read is to keep husbands and wives from sharing one pass. Think about all the assumptions wrapped up in that. Wow. As an anti, is using gender as an anti-fraud marker. Wow. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, like I said, we could go on for an hour because there is so we much. Really could. We really could. Why, really why do we insist on gender as a primary identifier, even in a legal realm? It's a really, really old and tough issue to get around. Mm -hmm. And we are almost certainly out of time for that. So, <laughs> but I would love to do another panel on that next year, maybe. <laughs> so. Yeah. That, I mean, what a great, oh, wow. We've just come around into a whole new topic. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I think it, I think we certainly can, um, you know, kind of close in on, on that topic and give people food for thought. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure that we can um, engage uh, in that. But I did want to read, we have a comment um, it, that uh, this has been a great session, very informative and engaging. Thank you, Danny, Dr. Lug and Aaron. So um, we've, we've kept a, quite a number of people on with us um, and this has been fun. So I do want to um, say thank you for your participation. And if you have any further closing thoughts, I think that's a fantastic closing thought. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of thought goes into using gender markers as policing is my mind is blown. Um, <laughs> um, but if you have um, additional thoughts before we close, um, um, feel free. If somebody wants a copy of my slides, just contact me at Rutgers. Do you want to shoot out an email real quick? You want to tell us your email real quick? Yeah, it's uh, lug at gse.rutgers.edu. Excellent. Excellent. Or have any questions. Yeah, great. Um, Aaron, do you have contact information? Uh, the easiest way to get to me is going to be through, um, well, you can either reach out to the Rustin Center. It's rustincenter.org. Yep. Uh, or um, my email address is pretty much my name. <laughs> um, Aaron.m.worl at gmail.com, but it's probably easier to go through the Rustin Center and right. Robert, because I may not be the right person to ask. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I've, I've talked a lot here, but there are so many more people with so much more knowledge that are connected to the center that uh, from all sort of professions, walks of life, academic backgrounds that, that might actually have a better answer for you than I do. So I would really recommend contacting uh, or reaching out via RustinCenter.org. Fantastic. And um, another comment came in. Thank you all for this uh, uh, conversation. Very informative. So um, I do want to say thank you. And my information, um, again, I am the coordinator for Union County's Office of LGBTQ Affairs. And so I can be found, and there's a kitty, I can be found at ucnj.org um, slash. I'm it took this long for that to happen. <laughs> It's pretty great. Um, UCNJ.org slash LGBTQ. So, um, and thank you to NOW, uh, New Jersey's um, NOW uh, chapter. Um, I, I, this has been uh, just, this is the beginning of a conversation, obviously, because we just ended on a note that can take, an, take us another hour. So um, I, I really appreciate your participation and I really appreciate um, that NOW is, is hosting these 
uh, very important discussions and sometimes they're difficult to have. So um, I, I really appreciate your participation and, and, and thank you to now. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that will end us for this evening.